live on the Chatterbox Sports Network. I'm Justin Kinner. He's Kev Nash. Mr. Kev Nash, happy Monday. Welcome. What up, though? How's your weekend? It was good. I celebrated a birthday over the weekend. Did you drink so much you puked? No, I did not. I puked a lot this weekend. Were you drinking? I wish. Oh. I got a little bit of the, the, the food poisoning this, this past. It wasn't even really weekend. It was into the weekend. Uh, but, I, I, you know, it was. I like to call it dieting. I lost some weight. <laughs> I lost some weight. It's, uh, but, uh, yeah, I've never had food poisoning before. Not fun. Not fun at all. So glad you're bounced back. Yeah, me too. I was, uh, you know, we didn't do the show Friday because I got sick. I was, I was looking forward. We were supposed to do the show from the Chatterbox Sports Studios, of course. I was all looking forward to that, but I, I cannot function on Friday. Let's just put it that way. Um, nonetheless, but, man. But that still didn't mean there wasn't a whole lot to talk about uh, coming out of that weekend. Ooh, you had the spring game. Yeah. You had the Masters. Mm-hmm. You had the Reds sweep of the White Sox. I mean, there's a ton going on uh, in the world of sports, and we're less than ten days away. Are we ten days? I think we're ten days away. Either way, we're I think we're ten days away from the draft. Yeah. Or, I mean, there's Thursday. Yeah. I mean, like right now, for there being no football. I mean, like, again, you got that that uh, that palate cleanser, if you will, of the spring game. We're going to talk about that with Dan Hope coming up here of Eleven Warriors in just a little bit. Uh, College Football Hall of Famer Keith Byers is going to join us in studio, so we have a lot coming your way. Again, happy Monday! It's the Kinner and Kev show here one more time, fourteen ten ESPN Radio and Chatterbox Sports on YouTube. We hope again, hope everyone had a great weekend, uh, no doubt about it. All right, so we kick off every show uh, with what's trending, and we just take a look at some of the top storylines coming out of the weekend and uh, some things that kind of caught our attention, um, and let's get let's get to it, shall let's we? Do how, it. How let's do th- it. How about this? ESPN Films, uh, they have greenlit a 30 for 30 documentary on trailblazing broadcaster Stuart Scott, uh, Stuart Scott, one of my all-time favorite uh, sports personalities in media. Uh, 30 for 30 has been greenlit. I'm really looking forward to that when that comes out. Absolutely. I mean, you talk about, like, obviously the Stuart Scotts of the world, RIP to him, but, like, so many other people that we grew up watching have passed on. So it's great that they're going to be doing a 30 for 30 on him. And, you know, Stuart Scott was still, like, one of those people that brought personality to ESPN and Sports Center before the first take era. It was really all about, you know, the Sports Center and the highlights of the game and to be able to bring your own personality to that. He was definitely one of the forefathers of that. So I'm happy to see this and I'm very excited to check it out. Yeah, I remember Stuart Scott just because, like, to me, he was the norm. I mean, that's right when I first started watching Sports Center religiously. He's who was always on the tube, right? So, like, mm-hmm. to me, that was the norm. So when people talk about how he was a trailblazer, and I'm not saying he wasn't, I'm just saying, like, it, it, it's odd to me that before him, it was just very uppity, stuffy, boring uh, type of analysis on the old, you know, network. So, uh, nonetheless, I'm really looking forward to that. And um, most that you would out. get uh, Dan Patrick with his own yeah. personality. But, like, when Stuart Scott became a part of ESPN, like, it got ramped up to a whole different level of being yourself and being a personality and like people actually tuning in to see what he was going to say or when he was going to say his catchphrase and what highlight was going to get it so it like it definitely changed a lot because i remember like even like kind of like the backlash from people when he was on there and saying we don't need that in sports and stuff like that you know and now you look at you know today's sports landscape all it is is you know catchphrases and people's outgoing personalities being on full display uh, I'm definitely a personality, no mm-hmm. doubt. Speaking of personalities, Deion Sanders. Coach Prime. Colorado head coach Deion Sanders says that he will allow allow <laughs> Travis Hunter and his sons to play for the Eagles, the 49ers, the Cowboys, the Commanders, the Ravens, and the Falcons. He will allow them to play for those teams, Kev. Run down those teams again. So these are the teams that, according to reports, Colorado head coach Deion Sanders said in a press conference over the weekend that he will allow Travis Hunter and his sons to play for the Eagles. Mm -hmm. The 49ers. Play for them. Cowboys. Play for them. Commanders. Play for them. The Ravens. Play for them. And the Falcons. Play for them. And the Reds. (laughs) Oh, wait. No, sorry. Yeah, and the... (laughs) (laughs) Like, okay. Okay, Coach. You know, I I totally understand where he's coming from, but I also understand where people get uh, rather annoyed with Coach saying stuff like this. Um, Allow them to be played. Like, if their talent's... Uh, allow them to get drafted by those teams. It kind of kind of works both ways. It isn't solely one way or the other. And also, like we talk about, like you know, athlete empowerment. 
is athlete empowerment when you have the power, when you have the juice and when you have the the gumption and the the game to back it up. Like I know that that Travis Hunter was the number one high school player coming out of high school. I know that Shador started the season off pretty good last year, but like all that stuff waned throughout the season. Let's not forget they went four and six last year. Um, so you have to show and prove on the field. And all this talking that's happening in April needs to be translated not only in September, but October, November, and December in order for them to basically pick their landing spot. It's the Kenner and Kev show here on a Monday, 1410 ESPN Radio, Chatterbox Sports. What's trending? Uh, you'll stay in the NFL, Kev. How about this? Daniel Jones is basically done as a starting NFL quarterback, an executive told Fox. Wow. Now, this is a year removed from, of course, the Giants giving Daniel Jones a $40 million per year contract. Uh, many people were scratching their heads at that, of course. You could say he led them to the playoffs a few years ago or he was the quarterback on a team that went to the playoffs one way or another. It was still a contract that had a lot of people scratching their heads, including the decision makers who made the decision themselves because now they're looking at this draft uh, as a way to, as a mulligan, as a way to fix that potential mistake. The Giants have always uh, liked him better than everyone else in New York Giants, you know, as, as New York Giants signed Jones to a $180 million contract. But yeah, these reports that Daniel Jones basically done as a starting NFL quarterback, oof, interesting nonetheless. Uh, Giants, you know, not being talked a lot about with this draft coming up, but, uh, you know, anytime a team takes a quarterback, it always creates a lot of buzz and talking points, and the Giants could potentially be doing that at the draft 10 days from now. Nightmare situation, because obviously, like you just said, they just paid him. Like, they literally just paid him last year, and I know the contract was worked in a way where they can get out of the deal a little bit sooner than people are expecting, but still, he's still getting a nice chunk of that money, and now you're set your franchise back by saying, like, yeah, you're not the guy. Like, <laughs> what happened between him ink to paper and now that you say, like, he's not the guy? Because the same question marks that people had about Daniel Jones right now are the same question marks that they had before the new coach showed up. So what happened between then and now that you say, like, yeah, you're not the guy that we thought you were? I, I'm very curious to see what they're going to do in the draft. Yeah, we've, we've seen teams change their mind on quarterbacks pretty dang quickly, but usually it's after they draft them, not after they make a, a big contract uh, extension like this. Usually once you make that extension, it's not that you're married long term, but you're usually married a lot longer than a year, uh, no doubt about it. I tell you what, if you would have said a year ago, who's more likely to move on from their quarterback, uh, the Giants or the Cardinals? I would have said the Cardinals, no doubt about it, but the Cardinals are looking to build around, continue to build around their quarterback in Kyler Murray. That's why they're rumored to be tanking Marvin Harrison Jr. with the number four pick in the draft 10 days from now. Uh, so we'll see where the Giants uh, kind of go from here, no doubt about it. Again, NFL, we stay. Justin Jefferson, uh, you know, he is not present for the Vikings' first day of voluntary workouts. Again, voluntary, <laughs> but we all know there's the the silent uh, I N in there. You know, you know, it, it's not, it, look. You have to show up to these, right? These aren't voluntary. This is all um, peer pressure. It, it's a way to guilt you into showing up to these, so that when you don't go to the vo when you don't volunteer to go to the volunteer workouts, you're looked at as a bad guy. No Justin Jefferson at voluntary workouts for the Vikings. <laughs> yeah, this is a nothing burger for me. Uh, the only way it's a something burger is because ultimately, same thing that's probably going to happen with T. Higgins. They're going to sit out until he try to get the contract. Either they are or aren't going to get the contract, and he's going to suffer a soft tissue injury. He's going to pull a hamstring because he hasn't been in football shape. So, Hopefully, Justin Jefferson, which I know he already is doing, just like T. Higgins is doing, working out on his own, trying to stay healthy as possible and try to get that contract situated because it's voluntary. It's all voluntary. Yeah, you want to show up. I think it would be more critical him not showing up if it was like they had a second-year quarterback. I think it would be way more uh, of a big deal. But, like, nobody believes that Sam Darnold is going to be the guy for them long term. No, and I agree with you. And if he was like, so I don't, at first I thought Sam Darnold was the guy, the starting quarterback for the Vikings heading into this year. The Vikings starting quarterback is not on the roster at this exact moment. <laughs> he will be on the roster 10 days from now. So if the first opportunity for those two to be on the field together at the same time comes and, and he's not out there, then I would have a problem with it. It's the same reason years ago when Aaron Rodgers wasn't showing up to voluntary workouts with the Green Bay Packers, that became news. Mm -hmm. Well, ironically enough, Aaron Rodgers reports to voluntary workouts with the Jets here today. <laughs> Showing up with a smile. I did want to say one more thing about the whole situation going on with the Giants. Yep. Most of the time when teams move off from a player 
after they got a contract it's a whole new regime it's not only a new head coach but it's a new gm these are the same people in charge with the new york giants so again what happened between yeah we want to give him this contract this is the contract we we negotiated with his agent we agreed his party his team and our team agreed to this contract and what happened between then and now that now nah, he's not the guy because he didn't play a lot this season he got hurt early in the season so like it wasn't like he put out like a horrible season put up a horrible start to the season and got hurt and didn't play the rest of the year so what happened between those parties to say yeah you're not going to be a starting quarterback especially for the giants yeah and too and you know you saw when the second that that contract got done there was a lot of media <laughs> scratching their heads but you know there was a lot of players too i mean look there's a reason saquon was so like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. you're gonna give him 40 mil a year and you're going to make me hold out. You're going to make me look like the bad guy in this. Obviously, no longer a giant at the moment. But, I mean, you saw players kind of, they couldn't speak out on it, but they were kind of subtly doing it. Uh, you know, by the way, the Justin Jefferson thing real quick with the voluntary workouts. I like uh, Michael Carnage in the chat says, uh, voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's you're, a good one. The voluntold workouts. You were voluntold to show up. Uh, to these like cutting uh, the grass and taking the trash out and doing yeah. the dishes exactly <laughs> or marriage you know whatever. yeah yeah, so, yeah there's that how about this in the nba so obi toppin um iron man obi the indiana pacers uh twitter account or x account if you will obi toppin uh they called him um, iron man obi obi toppin appeared in all 82 games this season that's a really cool number right there and another number that caught my attention buddy healed of course um, who was, you know, Buddy Heald is now the first NBA player with an 84-game season wow. in 19 years. Yes, there's 82 games yep. in a season. Kev, how the hell did he play in 84 <laughs> games this season? All 84 games that he was eligible to play in this season, he played in. But how did he get to 84 games? Got traded halfway through the season. I thought that was interesting because, I, honestly, I thought it was a riddle. I thought that they mistyped it. I was like, <laughs> idiots. I mean, it's come on. There's only 82 games. Yes, he was traded. I thought that was interesting. They had played more games at that point of the season than, the, you know, the Pacers at that point so nonetheless thought that was interesting 84 we talked so much about all the athletes that do not play uh or that you know the 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 load management and all that stuff um but role players you know are very very important you know the star players are who we're talking about with load management but it's up to the role players to step up obi one of the best role players in the nba kudos to him and then buddy healed who's on who's that fringe that fringe player he's not a superstar he's not a role player he's a star player you know he's on the verge of being that i guess um mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 84 games in the regular yeah season. i mean speaking of that and you talk about like superstars anthony davis played a career high 76 games this season so that that should be commended i mean as much as we talk about how fragile he is you know uh street clothes and all those nicknames that people have for anthony davis played 76 games this past season i believe kevin durant also played 75 games so if the ploy about you know making nba all first team to win awards you got to play 65 games is the reason we're getting guys to play more games or whatever the case may be or if it's a hey, the lakers are playing more games because anthony davis is on the floor because they're trying to make their way into the play-in tournament or out of the play-in tournament whatever it takes to keep these athletes and these great basketball players on the court i'm absolutely here for Kenner and Kev Show, 1410 ESPN Radio. We talked about Justin Jefferson a little bit ago not showing up to voluntary workouts. There's going to be a lot of teams who are concerned about their star players who are a little disgruntled when it comes to contract negotiations showing up, whether it be voluntary, whether it be you know training camp, whether it be playing at all this upcoming season. One of those teams, the Cincinnati Bengals, but I don't think they have to be concerned. T. Higgins, uh, you know, made the rounds a little bit this past weekend with a little viral clip that went around that has Bengals fans feeling very excited about this upcoming season. The Cincinnati Bengals made a statement about T. Higgins. T. Higgins made a statement about his upcoming season with the Bengals. We'll talk about that when we come back. It's the Kenner and Kev Show, 1410 ESPN Radio and Chatterbox Sports. We'll be right back.
And we are back. It's the Kinner and Kev Show, Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM. We'll get into the spring game coming up with Dan Hope from 11 Warriors here in just a little bit. Of course, Kev Nash was at the spring game. We'll get I'm curious your thoughts on that in a bit. I'm here to tell you, I think the most overrated thing in all the college sports is spring games. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Going to, it's awesome. That I mean, like, and it's cheap. It's probably the cheapest college football game you'll ever go to. I'm not judging those who go to games or enjoy watching them on TV. I think they're it's not fun to watch on TV, but it's cool to hear college football on TV in April. But I just laugh when people try to get like, oh, man, I don't know. I wasn't really sold on the defense, but after what I saw this past Saturday, <laughs> man, I am locked in. I am locked in <laughs> on Buckeye football because of that defense. So, yeah, we'll get to that with Dan Hope coming up here. Indeed. Just a little bit. Indeed. Keith Byers will be. Um, in studio as well. One thing I want to talk about with Keith Byers is his thoughts on this. One thing Urban kept talking about was about, and we've heard this for years now with the transfer portal about how you know everyone just up and you know uprooting and leaving is you got to re-recruit your roster every year. And I'm like, here's a message for all bosses out there: you should always be re-recruiting your staff, your employees, your roster. I think it's kind of a real weird sleazebag thing to say when you're urban and all these coaches god i gotta i guess now i gotta start being nice to my team <laughs> you know because you only i, I want to talk to buyers i want to know how long into his ohio state freshman season before he realized that the honeymoon stage is over the wooing stage is over you know like once you sign the commitment like you're you know you're you're theirs right like right. Like, that's weird to me I, I just feel like that shouldn't be new like coaches shouldn't like so nothing's real like, you know what I mean? But, like, I just feel like that's the same thing, too. Like, how many times, you know, when you get a new job and it's the honeymoon, so, you know, every time I was told yep. this by a former boss of ours that was here, um, that when you get hired, ask for everything right away. Ask to use budgets. Ask to use everything right away because they're trying to make sure you're happy, too. But after a little bit, the honeymoon stage fades <laughs> off. And what you settle for early is what you're settling for for the remainder of your tenure, yep. right? So, 100%. I, I just, my, my thing is, like, I just don't get why bosses are like that to where, like, they just feel like after a certain point, oh, I've been here long enough, they've been here long enough, they ain't going anywhere, whatever. And if they go over somewhere, so be it, whatever. But this, I, I just, I, I had a problem with that. And I'm curious to talk about that, KB. But I know that's not what I wanted to come back with. But since we're here, <laughs> we're, I do, well, we're here now. I, I, I just, I do not like that. Um, I'm not a fan of that, Kev. Like, oh, we have to re-recruit our roster. Or we have to, re you know, like you should. Oh, that should have been the case beforehand. And if it wasn't like that beforehand, then you're just a bad. That's that's a bad approach on your end, I guess. Is at the end of the day, I'm trying to be nice on a Monday. <laughs> it's a Monday. Uh, you know. Uh, so I didn't watch the game yet. I actually uh taped it because you know I was at the game, whatever. So I plan on rewatching it because I missed part of the first half because traffic was absolutely insane at the shoe. This past weekend, but um, you know, I have heard a lot of coaches talk like that and have that type of sentiment, that that reaction. I mean, you know, you and I kind of touched on it when Coach K retired, when uh, Roy Williams retired, when Nick Saban retired. But you know, hearing Urban Meyer say it, obviously about you know the program that we closely followed, the Buckeyes, it's like, well, wait a minute. Everybody has to adapt to their new surroundings and their everyday job, so. Let's just take this for instance. You and I, we have to adapt to our jobs seeming like every six months there's something new that's going on. So, you know, from, you know, with, with COVID. So, like, hey, we're just telling people to listen to radio, listen to the radio. Then we had to go to where our listeners were. We found out that, hey, man, they're on social media all the time. They're on Facebook. So we started doing the show video form on Facebook and then to YouTube and now linking up with the great folks at Chatterbox. So we're finding where our listeners are, um, you know, back in the 90s and 80s and everything like that. We could just simply jump on the microphone and say, hey, tune in. And just Everybody just tunes in. So we had to adapt and we have to adapt to the social media era. I mean, we're a big, big town that used to have a GM plant here. When GM started phasing out workers for, you know, robots and things like that, those workers there had to adapt to working with robots and to be able to keep their job. I'm not sure why, especially college coaches, because you don't hear this from the NFL when free agency comes around. You only hear this from the college coaches because the college coaches have had a ruling fist over the college player for so many decades that this is totally new to them. Guess what? Adapt. Adapt. The players have to adapt every single year when you out recruit them. You know, CJ Stroud had to adapt when um, 
Quinn Ewers decided to show up on campus a year early. He had to adapt to that situation. So the fact that these college coaches in basketball and in football have to adapt, I'm not going to feel sorry for them, even though it does cause a you know ripple effect to the team that I love, the Buckeyes. Well, Coach, that's, that, that's part of your job is to adapt. If the everyday Joe out there listening to this radio that works his job has to adapt to a new employee at his job, to a new boss at his job, to a new form that they have to fill out or a new budget they have to do, the coaches should be able to adapt to that as well. This is just something that you got to adapt to. And if you don't, get out the way and we'll find somebody that will. Because that's what they do in the real world where you and I live and our listeners live. Oh, no doubt. And and, and the thing is, though, like, it's just weird that adapting is, oh, now I got to treat my <laughs> roster better. Like, that. that's just wild to me. And, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I, like, I hear coaches say that all the time. We got to re-recruit our roster. You mean reassess or reassure them or, or just like sit down and talk about expectations? You mean that wasn't what you were doing before? <laughs> you weren't, you know, um, but like I said, you know, I heard KB talk about this on his show a little bit earlier today, just, you know, saying how like, yeah, there is a certain point, you know, where things do change, you know, all of a sudden you're somebody, you know, your coaches are wooing you like crazy. And then all of a sudden the wooing stops because, hey, they were wooing you as the high school recruit. Right. Now you are the freshman player. Now you got to prove that you're a college football player, and now you got to do the wooing. Now the player has to do the wooing. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it is wild. You know, calling the games to right state this year. You know, Scott Nagy loved him as a coach, right? But like, and I loved it because of the message he had. You know, he tells recruits when they come here, "Hey, I know the portal's a big thing, but if, we, if you're coming to this school to play for us, we want you to be here to be here for the next. You know, we want you to finish. We, if you're thinking about using this as a springboard, we don't want you here. Right. That was his message. What does he do? He gets up and leaves. Like that's the thing. These coaches, it's all, it's all, it's all charade. It's all joke. Like it, it, it's you know I, I've always been like oh the player needs to do what the coach says blah blah blah. But like it, this stuff just is annoying. Or oh, I've got to re-recruit our roster. No, you just got to treat everyone you know with as much respect as you can uh, and go from there. But there's my Dudley do right. Uh, <laughs> you know whatever. So on the flip side of that, and to play devil's advocate to kind of understand where coach is coming from. I don't think he's talking about, you know, the the stars of the team, so to speak. I don't think he's talking about, you know, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. or any of the offensive linemen, like the big stud type of players, the guys that go get it done for you. I think he's talking about to the depth of the roster. I think he's talking about that true freshman that came in highly touted and didn't sniff any playing time, that played nothing but special teams all season long, and he's getting wooed from, you know, another team in that conference or somewhere across the country. Say, hey, man, you know, you can come in here and start for us right away. So I think he's talking about that specific type of recruitment because nobody is letting their star quarterback walk out the door. Like if if uh, C.J. Stroud, just to say C.J. Stroud had decided to come back uh, for a year. And he's like, you know what, Coach Day, I'm thinking about hitting the port. I'm thinking about going to Auburn. They're offering me X amount of dollars. That that wasn't going to happen. But the people behind him, and we just saw that with Queen Ewers, where he's like, hey, man, I'm not going to play this dude. C.J. Stroud's going to be here for the next two years. I need to hit the portal to find somewhere that I can go. So I think Coach Meyer was talking to like, hey, man, we recruited this player. We want him to work the steps and go through the system to be a player for us in the future. But right now isn't the time. I think that's what Coach was saying. Granted, I didn't hear it. But like when I hear them talk about that, that goes with the job. Because guess what? You also have to do the recruitment or re-recruitment of a player that's potentially thinking about going to the NFL draft early. So you have to do that song and dance. So this song and dance, I don't see that big of a difference. Well, it's like, you know, having a job without a non-compete. <laughs> wink, wink. It's always competition. It's always competition. <laughs> Should you have to? <laughs> you have to keep recruiting your current roster. You should. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the smart thing to do. Lock a good player up. Uh, but, keep a good uh, player happy. Yep. You know, it is what it is. It's the Kinder and Kev Show, 1410 ESPN Radio. Speaking of keeping a good player happy, I would say a good player to keep happy is none other than T. Higgins. Okay. And T. Higgins, um, you know, over the weekend at his youth camp, um, Made, you know, obviously addressed the media. Uh, you know, ESPN's Ben Baby says Bengals wide receiver T. Higgins told reporters at his youth camp uh, over the weekend that he anticipates playing for Cincinnati in 24 after previously requesting a trade. Now, let's be clear here. Nothing's changed. T. Higgins 
requested a trade. T. Higgins wants to be traded. But when T. Higgins says he wants to be traded, he wants to be traded with the idea of, I want to be traded to a team that's going to give me the extension. I want my extension. He's going to get 21 point something mil and is fully guaranteed, uh, you, you know, contract this upcoming season after getting the franchise tag put on him. But there was the punch counter punch because then ESPN's Jeremy Fowler tweets out a little bit after that, that the Bengals have made clear behind the scenes with the draft coming up that they have no plans to trade T Higgins. <laughs> uh, they want another run at a Super Bowl with Jamar Chase and T Higgins on the outside. So this is of course led to a lot of talking points over the weekend. And the reason that is very important is for a lot of reasons. And one thing that I thought was interesting, uh, there was a stat that had come out, um, about Joe Burrow and, and, and the good chunk of his yards, 50% of his yards have be- come between T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. If, that, if that's a reason right there why you'd, you want to hold on to T <laughs> as long as you can, it, it's it right there. Like, do I, think, do I think Joe Burrow could continue being an elite quarterback without T? Yes. Do I think it's going to become more difficult? Yes. Um, you know, I'm watching Patrick Mahomes do it, um, still be an elite quarterback without, uh, you know, an entire roster of elite pass catchers outside of his tight end, of course. So it can be done, and I understand why the Bengals are doing this. Here's the deal. I'm always looking for a reason to take shots at the Bengals, and I'm here to defend them slightly, and here's why. They, like, this idea, because Bengals fans are mad at that. I can't believe they're not even having conversations with T. Higgins. They don't have to. <laughs> they, they don't have to. They don't want T. Higgins after this season. Now, let me rephrase that. Wanting and prioritizing are two. They are not financially prioritizing T. Higgins after this upcoming season. Do they want T. Higgins? Of course. I want a pony. Can't afford a pony. I don't really want a pony. I don't know why people always say that. Is there any kid out there that really wants a pony? Why is that always a thing that people always say? Hey, if you're good, I'll give you a pony. At no point when I was a kid did I want a pony. A new bike. New bike, video game. Oh, absolutely. Give me a pony. I don't care about your damn pony. <laughs> but anyways, besides the point. Bottom line is the Cincinnati Bengals, it's okay that they are drawing a line in the sand saying, hey, we're going all in with T. Higgins for one more season. And then after that, we'll reshift our focus towards providing more pass catchers for Joe Burrow in a more financially responsible and fitting way. I don't, I'm not bagging on the Bengals for deciding that they don't want you know, to, to extend T. Higgins. They're not going to extend T. Higgins. People are making a big deal about some of the extensions being done for a lot of guys on uh, you, you know, the What's the, the the tag, the franchise tag? Mm-hmm. You know, some guys on the franchise tag are getting extensions done. T. Higgins isn't even, you know, hasn't even held communications with his team about it. People mad at the Bengals for it. The Bengals don't need to. They're basically saying, look, we knew when we gave Joe Burrow this big contract, we weren't going to be able to keep him and T. and Jamar. That's why the fans out there who were clamoring about that for years, I kept saying, I'm not a hater. You're chalking up everything I say to, oh, he's just a Browns fan. But it's common sense. There was never a scenario in the history of God's universe where T. Higgins – And Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase were going to be long-term teammates. It was just never going to happen. And kudos to the Bengals for acknowledging that and understanding it and saying, hey, we could trade him, we could get some draft picks back, but you know what? We are going all in for one more season. And then after that, we'll reevaluate after the year because, oh, yeah, they're also about to take care of Jamar Chase. And as I've pointed out in years past or in, in months past, Kev, there has never in the history of the NFL been a team with the highest paid quarterback and the highest paid wide receiver on the same roster. It's never happened. I thought we were going to see it with the Kansas City Chiefs. They decided that it was actually made more financial sense to take that money and spread it out over the defense and hope that you could draft enough playmakers to allow your franchise quarterback to elevate and do their job. That was Patrick Mahomes' job, to win Super Bowls, to win games with not that talented of a wide receiver core. And they did that. Of course, it helps when you have the best tight end in football. That's going to be Joe Burrow's responsibility, but he'll have one up on Patrick Mahomes because it looks like they're going to give him Jamar Chase. I just, I have, I, I hope T. Higgins plays. As a Browns fan, I don't. But I hope T. Higgins plays uh, from a Bengals fan standpoint. Um, but I have no problem with the Bengals basically saying, hey, we're, we're bringing you back for one more year, but we're not. <laughs> We're not trading you, but we're not giving you an extension. Let's just go enjoy this upcoming season and, and move on after the season. They did it with Jesse Bates. Tyler Boyd's not the same, but they well, one more year with Tyler Boyd and moved on from him. No hurt feelings, no questions asked. They just moved on. The Bengals are making the right decision, in my opinion, at this point. Going in with T. Higgins for one more year, giving him that fully guaranteed, you know, obviously the franchise tag, and then looking for his replacement next year or possibly in this draft coming up. The only rebuttal and the negative, I would say, would be if they let him walk next year and they get nothing in return for his service. That's the only rebuttal I would have. But since you covered that, I want to talk about this segment of this. So in the 2020 draft, there were 13 wide receivers taken in the first two rounds. Henry Ruggs, he's in jail. Jerry Judy, he's on his second team. CeeDee Lamb is a baller. 
Uh, Jaden Ragar, no idea where he's playing football now, if he is. Justin Jefferson, pretty good. Brandon Ayuk, pretty good. Looking for a new deal as well. T. Higgins, pretty good. Michael Pittman, pretty good. Uh, K.J. Hamler uh, for the Broncos, had a couple splash plays, but nothing to write home about. Uh, Chase Claypool, he's back home in Canada playing uh, for the Canadian Football League this upcoming season. Van Jefferson is, like, on his third team. Um, Demarius Mims, Denzel Mims, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure where he's playing football right now. So, like, there seems to be, like, a wide range of not even a wide range. I think you have the two stars in this with C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, and then you got a, a step down with the Iukes, T. Higgins, and Pittman, and then the rest are. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, like, man, like, you got to go find another guy uh, uh, next year's draft or even potentially this year's because there's a whole bunch of guys in this wide receiver core in this draft. Um, I would definitely, if I'm a Cincinnati Bengals fan and the Bengals, I would try to bring him back and make him happy as possible for his last season with the Bengals. My only thing would be like, all right, if things aren't going our way halfway through the season, let's see what we can get for him on the trade market halfway through the season. Like, knock on wood, not trying to wish anything bad on uh, especially Joe Burrow, but like if he gets hurt again, he's out for the season again, then might be a fire sale. Might be a fire sale to, to trade him. Yeah, and I'll try to keep Kevin check with these Bengals jabs. <laughs> Joe Burrow's not injury prone, Kev. Like, stop it. <laughs> Nonetheless. But, yes. Injury uh, luck. Right. I call it injury luck. Um, yeah, like, heading into this, it's not like, oh, man, they should have traded him. Like, let's be real. You can get compensation for him at the deadline if it comes to that. Now, mm-hmm. again, you know, we've seen running backs traded at the deadline. What was the last? And I'm probably, I guess Amari Cooper was traded to the Cowboys years ago at the deadline, which was a big get for the Cowboys from the Raiders at that time. I'm trying to think of some big wide receiver moves at the deadline. And I'm am I missing an obvious one? I know I am. I feel like in the last six, seven years, the biggest wide receiver deadline trade, I mean in the mid in midseason, it was Amari Cooper to the Cowboys because they 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 desperately needed a, a pass catcher that season. Uh, and it was a huge for them. It turned their season around because they were kind of average offensively until that, you know, obviously they turned the corner there. So I'm trying to think, but the bottom line is, is there's going to be a team out there that desperately needs a wide receiver. Could it be the Chiefs? Could it be whoever? Uh, you know, at the deadline, it, he will not be traded this off season. Uh, he will not be traded at the draft. He, you know, he will play because you're not going to turn down the fully guaranteed money that's coming his way. So we we all know that. But the thing is, this idea that okay, that the key to the Super Bowl is T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. You had the second worst defense in the NFL last year and the second worst run game. And with the second worst run game, you moved on from your thousand yard running back with the second worst run game last year. We'll see who they replace him with in the draft coming up. I'm not impressed with what they have there. And then I like the safety that they added from the Ravens, but they t- basically lose DJ Reader and lose DJ Reader and replace him with another DJ Reader. I don't know how much better the defense is at this point. You're counting on second year development with Hill and some of these others, and obviously adding some impact guys in the draft. Uh, but outside of that, the Bengals have a lot of question marks heading into this upcoming season. Getting Burrow back makes people just automatically assume everything's right in the world. But their best chance is getting Burrow back, and obviously having T out there with Jamar definitely gives them that shot. But when you look at the teams that are in the playoffs, or that, that were in the playoffs last year, every team that has an expensive quarterback, like, okay, so the Baltimore Ravens just paid their quarterback just like the Bengals just paid theirs. The Ravens don't have an expensive quarterback on their roster, even though they, at the time they overpaid for OBJ, 15 mil for OBJ last year. Woof up. But the Buffalo Bills, Stephon Diggs last year, okay? Kansas City Chiefs, they didn't have an expensive wide receiver, but they had all their money loaded up on the defensive side of the ball. They won the Super Bowl. The Houston Texans, very good wide receiving core, but rookie quarterback. Cleveland Browns, expensive quarterback. Amari Cooper was expensive years ago. That's a hell of a deal for a 1,000-yard wide receiver in back-to-back years You know, in the AFC North and Amari Cooper. There. The Dolphins, non-expensive quarterback. They have a very good wide receiving core in the playoffs. Pittsburgh, multiple quarterback, <laughs> you know, whatever. Multiple uh, bad quarterbacks, some would say. You, you know, you look over in the <laughs> NFC, San Francisco, rookie quarterback contract. That's why they have all the weapons that they do. Dallas Cowboys, expensive quarterback. They paid for their wide receiver, but look at the cap hell that they're in this offseason. They're paying for it right now as far as that's concerned. Lions, not a super expensive quarterback as far as that's concerned, but young wide receivers. Uh, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they just got a deal done. The Eagles got a deal done coming into the year. The Rams, you know, they've been... I mean, they're magicians with their cap as far as that's concerned. And then the Packers, the bottom line is 
When you have an expensive quarterback, you can't have a T and a Jamar, but you can have it for one more year. So you might as well go in for it for one more year. They still have cap space. I'm, if you're a Bengals fan, I would be. I don't know why you guys aren't more upset with why they haven't spent more or weren't more aggressive in the offseason. The offseason is not done. The draft's still coming up. But at the end of the season, if the Bengals get back to an AFC championship game and come up short, if the Bengals get to the playoffs and come up short, and then we're talking about, man, if they just had better linebacker play, if they if they just would have been a little deeper in the secondary, man, if they would have just you know improved the run game or whatever, you're going to sit there and say, man, we were this close. If we would have just done this, well, this is the time that that talking point should be front and center for you. I have no clue why more Bengals fans are not upset. People mad about the Cowboys not going all in. People mad about a lot of teams not doing more. The Bengals should be the team doing the most. You, you can't say we're going all in with T. Higgins and that's why we're, and then do nothing else of significance. Those are average moves. I like the safety they got, but they replaced DJ Reader with DJ Reader. They haven't really done anything else. I, I just I'm very underwhelmed with the Bengals' moves that they've made this offseason. And again, the draft's coming up, but at the same time, like you have the money to spend. It's all I heard. They had all this money to spend. They haven't done a damn thing with it, at least not of substance, in my opinion. Um, I think there's more talent in the draft than you uh can get in free agency the free agency there's a reason why teams are moving off of certain players and those players are far more expensive than the players that you're going to get in the draft i personally don't think that there's a lot of guys out there on the market that kind of like the Bengals need like they don't need rush ins they got herbert they got henderson you got those two bookend guys so like defensive tackle like that i believe that would be a need um secondary they 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 filled that need by bringing Vaughn Bell back in Stone. So, like, I, if Bengals fans help me out because I don't follow your team, like, I will follow my team like that. But where is the weak link? Obviously, everybody's going to go to offensive line. But what offensive linemen are out there? Because the team that I follow was also in the need for offensive line, and they haven't signed anybody either. So there's a reason why, like, a lot of these guys are still out there. Maybe they're waiting for the price to drop. Like, hey, man, I want $10 million a year. Like, eh, we can give you six. Like, so it's a song and dance. I personally think that if the Bengals go the draft route, I think they get more bang for their buck because that buck is going to get stretched even longer than just a one-year rental with a guy. Kenner and Cap, 1410 ESPN Radio. We'll get back into the Bengals coming up here in just a moment. we got some college basketball stuff to get into around the corner. The Dayton Flyers get a former Buckeye. Ohio State gets a f- uh, former Kentucky Wildcat. Uh, you know, we're going to talk a lot of college basketball coming up in hour two. Also, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk with Dan Hope from 11 Warriors, his takeaways from Ohio State's spring game. Depth is the most important thing for the Buckeyes heading into the 2024 college football season. We'll talk about that. Dan Hope, Buckeyes reporter for 11 Warriors, when we come back.
And we are back. It's the Kinner and Kev Show. Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM. 518-1410, 518-1410. That's the number to call and jump in on the conversation. We'll get to your calls in just a little bit. Uh, we're on the Chatterbox uh, Network on YouTube, by the way. Um, we're talking a little Bengals. T. Higgins, uh, you know, obviously saying over the weekend at his youth camp he expects to play for the Bengals this upcoming season. The Bengals double down saying, hey, we are letting all teams know around the NFL as the the draft is 10 days away. We are not trading T. Higgins. Uh, so we could put that to rest. But the question we kind of threw out, uh, multiple questions, but, you know, the Bengals – they they're saying they're going all in. That you know we're going all in. We're going you know bringing T Higgins back. You know Joe Burrow's going to be healthy. We want T Higgins back with Jamar Chase to go all in. But are the rest of the moves showing that the Bengals are going all in for a Super Bowl this upcoming season? You know again coming off a season second worst defense in the NFL, second worst run, uh, second worst run game. I mean there's a lot of holes. This idea that this team only missed the playoffs last year because Burrow was out. I mean there was a lot of holes. I, I don't. I mean if you tell me that the Kansas City Chiefs have the second worst defense. And the second worst run game in football, you're not picking them to three peat this upcoming season. So why are we feeling as if the Bengals are going to be, you know, just an automatic, you know, lock as a Super Bowl contender? We'll get back into that conversation coming up in a bit. Um, you know, some, Nate on YouTube says, Kenner, you don't understand. T will be traded in a package for Justin Jefferson. <laughs> Michael says. Along with Jamar Chase. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Wallace says, these guys might be Bengals haters, but they tell the truth. I, I mean, uh, yeah. Telling the truth is important. <laughs> All right, Michael says, I'm having Joey Votto flashbacks with T right now. We're not keeping him. Time to move on, guys. So, mm. interesting. But I appreciate the comments. Um, Nate says, the Browns spent so much money on Jerry Judy. What a waste of money if we're talking about AFC. Hey, no hating on the Browns. That's the only rule. <laughs> not a lot of rules on this show. That's one of them. But rules are the rules. Rules are the rules. <laughs> All right, Kenner and Kev, 1410 ESPN Radio. We welcome you back. Ohio State, the spring game is over the weekend. Kev Nash, you were there. I was there. I was in the building. Um, I got there a little late. I missed the first quarter because traffic was absolutely insane. It was insane going to the shoe. It was insane leaving the shoe. Um, uh, um, you know, it's so hard to get a grasp of, like, what you're watching. You know, the coaches are on the field. You got the media there. Um, doing interviews with coaches as you know things are going on. It's it's a practice, but it's not a practice. They're thudding, they're tackling. This is happening, that's happening. It's really just a celebration of you know Buckeye football, in my opinion. You know, I I would if I didn't go to the game, it would have been on the TV like in a background. But like going to a spring game is always fun. Last year's was a little bit more fun because the weather was better. But uh, you know, it was a good time. Nonetheless, uh, probably the most affordable Buckeye game you can Indeed. go to is a spring game. <laughs> no doubt about it. Dude, I mean, so many families were there. So yep. many families having yep. a good time, man. Because let's be real, man. Like you said, Ohio State football games are super expensive. So if this is a way to, you know, indoctrinate more people into the Buckeye coat <laughs> for a relatively cheap price, Come one, come all. And that's what I've always thought. Ohio State needs more fans. Like, there's just not <laughs> enough Buckeye fans. But, hey, you know, because of all those fans, it's why, you know, anyone that, uh, you know, lives in the Buckeye world, especially covering the team, we all do very well. Uh, and that's why I'm excited to bring on our next guest, Mr. Dan Hope with 11 Warriors. Dan, it has been a while. Welcome in. How was your spring game experience over the weekend? Back in my shoe again and, uh, you know, watch watch the Buckeyes again for well, the last time this spring. The last time we'll see the Buckeyes on the field for a few months. So, you know, wouldn't necessarily say it was a game that we necessarily learned a whole lot about the team. But uh, just to be in the shoe and see 80,000 fans in there and get to watch the Buckeyes in that environment is always fun. So everybody wants to know what's going on with the quarterbacks. Outside of the actual spring game, what do you guys take away from actual spring practice about the quarterback situation? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, based on what, you know, I've heard and, you know, most of the things they're saying, it would lead you to believe that Will Howard is still the front runner to be the starting quarterback of the team this year. I have to be honest, just based on what I saw from the practices we were able to attend, I was not super impressed by what I saw from Will Howard. And so uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Maybe he's killing it in the practices that, you know, we're not seeing. And so, you know, certainly he's a guy that has a lot of experience. It is his first spring in a new offense. And so you do expect there to be somewhat of an acclimation period there. But I think there's going to be more for him to prove in preseason camp leading up to the season. Because I think 
particularly in terms of that deep accuracy. You saw it in the spring game. You know, on the, the passes he proved that were longer down the field, you know, trying to get a touchdown, he, he was off the mark on a lot of those throws. And so I, I think that's going to be the biggest area of improvement for him if he's going to be the starting quarterback. You know, we know he's got some running ability. We know mm-hmm. he's got a lot of experience, a proven track record of winning games. But can he be that elite-level passer that we've become accustomed to seeing at Ohio State? Can he be that quarterback they need to take full advantage of all the talent they have at receiver? That's what I'm not sure about yet. What do you think is going to happen with the running back situation? I mean, you got two stud running backs back there, and I mean, I would love for the Ohio State Buckeyes to have two guys go over like 1,100 yards rushing. Both guys get like 15 touchdowns, kind of be like a ground and pound team, you know, make Woody Hayes proud. Yeah, it's certainly possible. I mean, you've got two guys who have both proven they can perform at that level. I think they're two of the five best running backs in the country and so I think it's certainly possible for both of them to put up those kind of numbers especially when you factor in that it could be a 16 or 17 game season and so um, you know I I think you know both those guys are gonna uh, you know have prolific seasons they're gonna you know split the workload which means you know neither of them is likely to have that you know 2,000 yard kind of season but I think you know by having both of them they're gonna be able to keep both of those guys fresh over the port close of the season Hopefully they both stay healthy, and I think if that happens, Ohio State is going to have the best running back tandem in the country. Dan, uh, you know, a while back I had a chance to catch up with Jim Trestle, and one thing I'd asked him about his thoughts on Ohio State heading into a season where, you know, it's the first year of the the 12-team college football playoff, and he had a lot of great insight, as he always does, but the one thing that he said was the most important for Ohio State, that he gives them the advantage over a lot of teams in the country, is, you know, to win, you know, in the 12-team college football playoff, you have to have depth because you're not, you know, that's we're talking about, especially coming out of a weekend, we're talking spring game and starters and position battles and all this, it's going to be the guys that don't win these position battles that are going to be responsible for helping you win a championship, you know, months and months from now. And he talked about depth being the most important thing. You know, there's going to be a lot of banged up starters. You know, the starters you have even going into the playoff may not be the starters that are starting the national championship game because injuries can happen over such a long season like this. In your in your opinion, what is the deepest position that they have and what is the position that you think is the most vulnerable heading into a season where, yes, you got to, you know, fight through to get through the regular season season in the Big Ten championship game, but also through quite a few games in the playoff? Well, the sarcastic answer would be ask me in two weeks. Because <laughs> yes, thank you. With the transfer portal here over the next two weeks, and that, you know, that that's going to affect the depth. You know, they could lose some of these guys who are backups at certain positions. And so, you know, you can look at a position like, I mean, I think if I have to pick one, I, I would say cornerback is probably their deepest position right now to have Denzel Burke. Davis, Nick Minos, and Jordan Hancock coming back. Then you have a guy like Jermaine Matthews that I think would be starting Mm -hmm. almost anywhere else in the country right now. Uh, Calvin Simpson Hunt's looking good. Uh, You know, Aaron Scott's a guy that's coming in but has a lot of talent. I think their depth at corner is is one position where, you know, I think if if all those guys stick around and they're all healthy, I think you could go three deep and be really strong at that cornerback position. I think, you know, the defensive line depth as well is certainly – uh, you know, very promising right now. You have guys like Jack Sawyer, JT Tuamolowau, Tyleek Williams, and Ty Hamilton back to lead the group. But then you have guys like Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson and Hero Canoe, Caden McDonald, Mitchell Melton. There's a lot of talent in that room. So, again, the, the, the first step here is keeping that intact for the next couple of weeks. But I, I think those are two positions that jump off the page right now in terms of as their roster is currently constructed. They've got a lot of guys who are capable of playing at a high level. So I went to the game, um, but traffic uh, prevented me from getting inside the stadium before the second quarter. It was a complete madhouse at the shoe, so I didn't get a chance to see, you know, the quote unquote starters. But like, where's Sonny playing this year? Is he is he still, you know, at safety? Is he officially dropped down to linebacker? Where is he going to be playing this upcoming season? He's a linebacker. He's he's a full time linebacker now. They have you know fully committed to that uh, position change, and so you know I. I think you know really the only way we would see him back at safety would be if you know there were a lot of injuries at safety but even if that being said I mean he's like 245 pounds now so Mm -hmm. he's he's really big to play safety at this point and so they fully committed to that linebacker track the question now is you know can he earn that starting job at 
will linebacker, or is he a guy who's maybe going to be uh, more of a situational player for his defense? Because you know, someone that obviously is a you know big name in your area, C.J. Hicks, I think has had a really good spring, and I think he's made a real push for that starting job as well. So I think that's a competition between those two that will continue into preseason camp. But I think one way or another, there's going to be a role for both of those guys. We saw even in the spring game them, you know, do some different things there, putting some free linebacker packages out on the field. And so I think there's certainly going to be a role for Sonny. What exactly that's going to look like, how big it's going to be, is still to be determined. Last question for me. Um, was it just me or did Lincoln Kinghouse look the best out of the quarterbacks? Uh, I would not have that uh, opinion, in, in my opinion. Okay. I, I think Devin had the best day among the quarterbacks personally. I don't I don't really think any quarterback in that game uh, you know, stood out, shined. Like I don't think that spring game is going to determine who the starting quarterback is gonna be this year because I don't think anybody was head and shoulders better than the other. But uh, in my opinion I thought Devin Brown had the best spring game and honestly out of the practices that we were able to watch this spring he was the guy that I thought consistently looked the best was Devin Brown. Okay. Uh, you know, I think Julian Stayan had some good moments as well. Not as much in the spring game. He certainly looked more like a freshman in the spring game. But uh, we saw uh, a lot of potential from him. Him making some great throws in the spring practices that were open to the media. But you know, I think you come out of the spring and there's not really a clear separation there at quarterback where one guy has consistently looked better than the others. I think. You know, all five of them have had their flashes, but there's still more that Ohio State's going to want to see from whichever of those quarterbacks are still on the roster in August. Dan Hope, 11 Warriors, covers the Buckeyes, hanging out with us here. Kenner and Kev's show here on a Monday, um, coming off the weekend with the spring game, of course. And, you know, uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, too, was, you know, last time we talked, you know, it was around the time, you know, Chip Kelly gets brought on board. And <laughs> was, uh, that was a very interesting move, nonetheless. But, I mean, he, he gets a lot of coverage. He gets a lot of play. He got a lot of, you know, exposure over the weekend. Just kind of as you've had time to sit back and just kind of navigate and watch his role uh, as it's developed more and more uh, since arriving in Columbus. Your overall takeaway of what his role, I mean, we know his role. We know what his, you know, responsibilities are. But, I mean, it seems like he, he's getting a lot of leash uh, here with this Ohio State offense, and, and rightfully so. Yeah, absolutely. And this is going to be a different dynamic for Ryan Day this year in the past. And that Ryan Day's not going to be the lead offensive play caller anymore. Chip Kelly is going to have that responsibility, and Ryan Day is going to trust him with that responsibility. And, you know, I think it's a lot easier for Ryan Day to finally do that and delegate when you have an offensive coordinator who, I mean, he literally coached Ryan Day in college. These guys mm -hmm. have worked together before. And obviously, you just look at Chip's resume, whether it be at Oregon, at UCLA, you know, over the years. He has a history of being an elite offensive play caller. And so I think, you know, this is I, – I really do feel like this is a good fit for all parties here. I think Chip was ready to take a step back from head coaching and just go back to being an offensive guru. And I think he's someone who, when he's been able to just focus on being an offensive guru, has been elite in that regard. And I think for Ryan Day, it gives him a right-hand man, right -hand man who he has a ton of trust in, and it allows him to feel comfortable delegating those offensive play-calling responsibilities and being more of an all-around head coach, whereas in the past, I just don't think he felt as comfortable with letting go of that. Dan, I lied. I got one more question. That wide receiver room, everybody's talking about <laughs> the freshman wide receiver. We see all the highlight reel catches on social media. Can we calm down as fans, or should we get very excited as fans? I think you should get very excited. Yeah! I mean, I, I mean, anyone who knows me knows I'm a level-headed guy. I'm not typically the kind of guy who's going to go all in on the freshman. I'm typically going to lean more toward the experienced players. But I've seen enough of Jeremiah this spring, maybe not in the spring game, but in the practices we're at. I mean, he's a special talent. He, he really is. I mean, we, we knew that coming in. But just seeing him in person, I think, really hits home how gifted a player he is. Seeing him make plays against a guy like Denzel Burke, who's one of the best cornerbacks in the country, really hits home how good Jeremiah Smith is. And so I, I think his ceiling is incredibly high, and I'm expecting big things from him right away. 
Dan, on the way out here, uh, you know, a basketball thing to send you out here. So Dayton Flyer fans are super excited here. Obviously, they find out that they get uh, Zed Key from Ohio State. He announced his commitment there. But, you know, we talk about a departure for the Buckeyes on the hardwood. Um, they've had quite a few nice additions. You know, they get the return of Michi Johnson. And, of course, uh, they get the, the big transfer today. Aaron Bradshaw commits to Ohio State, uh, you know, from Kentucky, the seven-footer. I mean, Ohio State has a lot of size. Uh, that's a, a second really big get out of the portal for Jake Diebler. Uh, just talk about Zed Key and what his departure means for the Buckeyes, what Dayton's getting with him, and then obviously the big announcement of Bradshaw to the Buckeyes today. Yeah, I think Dayton will be a good fit for Zed Key. You know, I think Zed kind of lost his role at Ohio State this past season with Felix Akpara emerging. He kind of dropped back into a backup role, and so he didn't have the opportunity to put up the kind of numbers he had in the previous couple of seasons, but I think Zed will be a good fit there at Dayton. I think, you know, that'll be a good, you know, opportunity for him to, you know, get back into a bigger role and, you know, have a productive season to finish off his college career. And then, you know, I think certainly for Aaron Bradshaw, I think you know, the upside there, you're talking about a guy who was a top five overall recruit in his recruiting class. Didn't have a great first year at Kentucky, but anytime you can add a guy with that kind of upside, I think that's certainly a, a bet that's worth making. And so I think to add him, especially with the loss of Zed Key, to pair with Felix Akpara and the front court, I think is an exciting addition for the Buckeyes. All right, Dan Hope, 11 Warriors. Dan, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, good stuff. It's the Kenner and Kev Show, 1410 ESPN Radio.
And we are back. Kenner and Cab, 1410 ESPN Radio. This past weekend, two firsts for me. The one was getting food poisoning. Never had that before. Yikes. Don't want it again. Although, losing weight was kind of cool. <laughs> the food poisoning diet, I highly recommend. Everyone talking about the calorie counting and keto and all this. Just eat some bad lettuce, dude. Come on. You'll lose five to six pounds in one day. Just like that. Just like that. Bad lettuce diet. <laughs> Trademarking that. Anyway, you know, got a wedding you're preparing for. Eat bad lettuce a week before. <laughs> All right. Pants a little tight. Eat bad lettuce. <laughs> Shirt not fitting the same. Eat some bad lettuce. <laughs> Face a little full. Eat some bad lettuce. <laughs> Devil's lettuce. That does the opposite. Oh, too. yeah. It makes you hungry. That make, yeah. Make, but it might help you eat more lettuce. So. <laughs> Shouts out the issue, too, baby. <laughs> What's going on with that, by the way? I uh-huh. don't know. Maybe we should ask Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But the other first, and, you know, there's interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, I got some in the mail. Oh, by the way, what's today? Tax day. Tax day. You know what I did today? Got my taxes done. Look at you. <laughs> would have no been done. present. <laughs> it would have been done on Friday, but ate some bad lettuce. So, uh. Uh, but uh, no. So, got the taxes done today. And just so you know, I want to let this be known. Oh, gosh. The city of Kettering, y'all can kick rocks. I owe y'all $8. And I promise you, when I'm done with this show, I will pull, I'm going to pay you $8 in eight $1 bills. And, I can, and I'm going to record me handing you this money so that in July, when I get that harassing letter from you that I haven't paid my taxes in 10 years, which I have all the proof that I have, I just, you know, and that's not, an, I, that's not a my bad thing. You don't go in that, like, some of my closest friends said that that happened to them, too. Now, we all don't have a club where we all get together and just, you know, hang out, eat bad lettuce, and don't pay our taxes. Like, Kettering, get your stuff together. But, yeah, when uh, Michael Maxwell, Airhead Tax Service, shout out to him. Indeed. Uh, did a great job, as always. But, yeah, he said, oh, you owe Kettering $8. I'm like, oh, no, I owe him $8 this year and $30 and $40 in the last you know couple of years. But just wanted to be known. I'm paying you all my $8. Leave me alone. I also paid those stupid camera tickets that I shouldn't have paid. Oh, you gave in. I gave in. Wow. It was either get divorced or pay the tickets. So I paid, as I say, I paid her tickets. (laughs) Mm. She was like, it was like kind of holding it. And I said, hey, if you don't pay those, that's on you. They said they would put a warrant out. I said they'd put a warrant out for your arrest, not mine. My name's not on the ticket. Till death do us part. Oh, man. That's amazing. Um, But uh, what? Oh, journey duty. Oh, like first I, that, time, first eh? time. I knew there was something. I was, I was getting somewhere. Jury duty. First time, eh? First time. I don't know if I could talk about like what I had to do for jury duty. It's been like ten years ago. I was actually on a. Uh, hopefully, I don't get in trouble. Like I, I was on a murder trial. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, was the OJ? It was not. Mm. It was not. Thank goodness. Too soon. No, not too soon. He's looking up at you right now, just so upset with you. He should have been in jail. OJ should have been in jail for killing those people. Um, But no, man, I I, I did it and haven't gone back. Actually, I I was so selfish trying to come up with my next joke. I just totally missed what you said. So an actual murder trial. Yes. Very nice. The Scranton Strangler. (laughs) No, 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 no. But funny enough, this is hilarious. So my dad and my mom... They both got jury duty at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. So like Those they two jury together? Stay no. Together. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, like, well, not obviously, like <laughs> they're not together, they're divorced and all that good stuff, you know. Oh, my bad. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> But the funny part was they see each other at <laughs> court. They're like, what are you doing here? Jury duty. What are you doing here? Jury duty. Whatever, whatever. So like they had a good laugh or whatever. Um my pops being the the guy that he is, you know, he stayed on and, and did it. My mom being the person that she is, she found every loophole there was to get out of it. So she didn't have to come back. <laughs> so I, I often wonder these things. My parents are complete opposites, like total different spectrums of the world. My mom was like a hippie or is a hippie and she loves rock and roll music. My dad heavy Motown guy like so I have no idea how I came to this world because they are absolutely nothing alike love them to death appreciate them for life but I don't those two people man like that that speaks to them to a T my pops hey well I'm here for jury duty let's do it my mom trying to figure out every way in the world how to get out of it 
So my wife's been called <laughs> to jury duty a few times, but like you know, they tell you to call and all this stuff mm-hmm. ahead of time. So she's been like, I know my luck. This is gonna be like the biggest like case in Dayton history, and I'm gonna be right there for it. But I'm gonna tell him, hey, I'm gonna talk about it. <laughs> You're not allowed. Then don't don't make me do this, dude. They wouldn't let me out. I told them I was like, hey man, I, I work in the media. Like, what do you do? Oh, I, I work on the radio. That. I told them everything in the book, and they would not kick me out. They would. They kept me on. I was did, like, Did what you tell you them everything? I told them everything. You do all the excuses. Like, <laughs> you know, I, they always tell you to say you're a certain thing to get out of it. <laughs> well, I think, I'd like to remain I employed, so I, I get out of jury duty. But you're also fired. So. And I don't. I was telling my brother about it. It was like, man, I tried to get out of it, man. Like I said, I worked in the media. I mean, I talk on the radio every single day. Like I could be, you know, whatever, whatever. They like, nope, you're good. And he was, he asked me, he was like, how many black people were there? I was like, me? He's like, that's why you were the one that was going to stay. There was no other black people. So, like, they have to have at least one black person <laughs> in the jury. You're going to be it. I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, dude. Like, they can't just have a jury of your peers and not have a array of people on the pool. Like, you live in Dayton, Ohio. You don't live, like, in, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> a certain other county. <laughs> So, like, yeah, it's like, it's like you would have had to go in there and just say some outlandish stuff to get out of there. So I was like, yeah. So I have a shot. That's what you're saying. You got a shot. I mean, until I check that box, because I am half Hispanic. So, I mean, there's going to be that uh-huh. whole thing. Like, oh, you check off two boxes, you know? I, I, I mean, but the thing is, if I have to do it, it better be worth my damn time. Because I love crime dramas. I love, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm obsessed with those. Um, I, I, you know. I love the law and orders. I love the criminal minds, the NCIS. I love all that stuff. Mm-hmm. FBI. I watch all that. Uh, you know, so I'm just, if it if it better be something cool. It better not be some you know twelve year old stealing gum from a local supermarket, and I got to figure out if he's guilty or not. But put him in an electric chair, man. Let's just get this going. <laughs> what are we doing? Um, but yeah, I, I've planned on saying, hey, I work in radio. I will talk about it every day if you make me do this. So I'm just saying, I, I will do whatever I have to to get out of doing this. But if they make me do it. So, yeah, like I said, my wife got out of it. I know my luck. I'm going to have to, be, you know, but yeah, but I did find out that they pay more than what I get paid here. So I was just about to that, tell you that. I was just know? about to tell you. I got a nice little check at the uh, end of, I think I was there for two weeks. Some say the money's not worth it. I'm like, y'all don't work in radio. So, you know, I'm excited to go make some more money than what I make here. Yeah, you know? I mean. I might get spoiled. I might, you know, I might yeah. just be a juror every day. Yeah, I got paid for work because you get paid when you have to still do jury duty. You get it doesn't even count against your PTO. So you you just hey man, I got jury duty. See you when I see you. You do that. You get paid from your regular job. You get a little check at the end of doing jury duty, and they feed you. Oh, there we go. Just like radio, except they pay you more. So <laughs> there you go. And the, you know, uh, by the way, so going back to the taxes thing, <laughs> uh, where'd it go? Where where did you go there? See, I'm trying to figure out this. It keeps moving on me. Uh, Drew said, Drew Garrison says, uh, join me in Miami's bird, Kenner. I am the de facto mayor of this city. You're going to waive my taxes? Mm. I mean, apparently I don't pay them anyway, so according to old Kettering, $8 <laughs> I owe them, $8. Eight American dollars. And, and I'm paying them an eight $1 bills. Might even throw some Frickers bucks in there, too, just to, <laughs> you know. Um and then they're going to send me some harassing letter. So apparently, I guess that happens in others. Some people are ch- chiming in saying, yeah, that's happened to them, too, and others. I'm like, what, what's going on? Knock on wood. Everything's been kosher where I live. Um, the only problem I had this year with my taxes is I owe the good old federal government, which is insane that I actually owe money. Yeah, you, got, had me, you had me off. I actually, I'm getting money this year. Really? Mm-hmm. Pretty excited. You're getting money? Pretty excited. I know where you work. I think it's pity. They're like, you made that much? You make that little? Oh, dude, here's charity. I think they get to write it off. I looked at Michael when he told me I owed. I was like, are you sure? Like, Can you recalculate that? <laughs> I was like, wait, what? That's what you get. <laughs> exactly. <That's right. laughs> exactly. Um, Michael says you should see if you can change those to $1 coins just to be annoying. Oh, I love being annoying. I'm the pettiest person you'll ever meet. So uh, what do they call that? Susan B. Anthony coin? <laughs> it's like, whatever you need to do to get it done. Drew also says, how much do I have to... How much do I have to super chat for Kenner to use a picture of me as his background for an entire show? Hmm. We'll see. Everything's for sale. Everything, yeah. Ted I, DiBiase. Yes. Everybody has a price. <laughs> um, what did did you have, since we're talking all this, you know, court and murder and all this other stuff? OJ. So he passed away. <laughs> yep. 
And y'all could say, oh, man, you guys are just being cold-hearted about this. I don't know what the proper approach should be. But I also had a very weird problem with the Hall of Fame, okay, Mm -hmm. doing the – I mean, we are saddened to learn of the past. And, and, and again, sometimes no statement is better than a statement. And I just thought that was kind of strange is all. People now, now can we stop with the Reggie Bush doesn't have his and, and they're <laughs> doing this? Like Reggie Bush, in my opinion, I know we defer the, yeah, just because the rules are, you could do that now and you couldn't then, you bought, you broke the rule then. I know, you, who cares? Whatever, you, you know. But there's no correlation mm-hmm. between Reggie not having his and then the Hall of Fame, you know, doing this, this spiel here. Uh, you know, but th- this whole thing with the OJ thing, you know, it's just wild. I I told you the time I tried to get an interview yeah, with OJ. Yeah, 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 And it was terrifying. I, I said, hey, you know, Keith Byers works with us. I know you two go back. You know, I'd love, you know, would you be willing to do an interview? I knew it was a long shot. I did, a long shot of him even responding. But OJ responds and says, you know, hey, young man, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not doing interviews right now. But when I do, I will reach back out, I'll put you on my list. And I said, there's nothing more terrifying than having O.J. Simpson tell you that he's putting you on his list uh, and all that. But people get so, uh, I would retweet, I found his videos hilarious. Hey, Twitter world, it's yours truly. I don't know why, like the guy was delusional. He had like, he had no self-awareness as far as like how every video he put out there, or he would just try to talk football regularly, like it was just no big deal, like just trying to live like a regular person in society and more power to him during that time. But people would get so mad at anyone that would interact with him or talk about him just as the football player, O.J. Simpson. Mm-hmm. But what was your thoughts when you saw that the Hall of Fame was putting out these mourn- mournful messages and all this stuff? Yeah, I saw the Heisman Trophy put out one. It was the Heisman. I said Hall of Fame. I think it was the Heisman. It was the Heisman Trophy. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, um, I think the Hall of Fame put their flags at half staff. That, that's okay. So I got them. Yes. The the Heisman Trophy was doing stuff for it too. The Hall of Fame did the flag. No, that, no, 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 no. That's no. I knew I was messing messing something Dude, here. That, that's what it was. That is that is disrespectful to, you know, our soldiers and the people that actually fight in wars and you go and fly flags half staff for a football player? No, we're not doing that. I I didn't like that at all. Um I really despise that. Um had no problem with the Heisman, you know, saying, you know, their their piece on their Twitter. Um, I, I, I So when I did see that from the Heisman, I immediately went to the Buffalo Bills to see, like, if they did anything. They did not. They had a, a farewell to uh, Stephon Diggs and an announcement of, you know, some um, guys being signed to the practice squad. Nothing about OJ. Um, and he killed their Super Bowl teams. <laughs> this guy uh then i went to the san francisco 49ers because that's where he ended his career absolutely nothing um some posts about um christian mccaffrey um doing some charity work awesome but nothing about uh oj simpson so then obviously the last place you go is uh usc and usc absolutely nothing not even from not from the athletic twitter football twitter not even the bar stool had anything about oj so the only one that i saw at least because i stopped looking um on Friday, when after the news came out, um, the only place that I saw do anything, quote unquote, for OJ was the Heisman. And then I saw that story about the Hall of Fame flying flags at half staff. Yeah, just very odd individual. Um, first of all, I don't like to see anyone lose their life by any means. Um, so, but it was just a weird, it was such a weird day of sports talk all day, just watching how people were juggling talking about it um, as, as far as that's concerned. You know, the people that were trying to talk about it. Like as if you know there was no con- like no uh, all the off the field stuff right. that exists, you know. And look, we deal with bad characters in sports all the time. And I'm not just saying this as a Browns fan who deals with a quarterback that has a very very bad reputation that has done some very very questionable things, right? But I've always said, I you know it's not a cop out. I just I don't worship the athletes. Mm-hmm. I've never put the athletes on a pedestal to the point to where I like you know buying jerseys all that fun stuff. That's cool. I have my favorite players. But I just because I'm a fan of what that particular person does for my football or basketball or baseball team doesn't mean that I'm supporting everything that they do on or off the field. Same thing like with the election coming up. I'm here to tell y'all. Oh we boy. don't talk politics, but I'm here to tell y'all there's a lot of you out there who hate LeBron James just because of his political take. I'm a LeBron James fan because he's one of the best basketball players in the history of the world, and I love basketball. It's as simple as that. Oh, you like LeBron James. You must be one of them lib people. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just a basketball fan, and we're watching greatness. What the hell? I don't care what he, you know, what he does and what he supports and all this stuff. You know, m- remember when you were young and your teachers would tell you, "Show me who your friends are, 
and they'll show me who you are. Right. I have never had anyone tell me that about, show me who your athletes are, and that'll show you who you are. No one's ever said that. So why do we make up these stupid rules of, oh, you're a Browns fan. You must support what he did. Be quiet. Just stop talking. Like It's just weird how we have to do these mental gymnastics of how we talk about athletes who make bad decisions off the field as if we did it. I don't, I don't support these athletes for what they do on or off the field. I simply tune in to be entertained from a football, basketball, baseball, professional wrestling, whatever it is that I'm entertained by, uh, t- television, shows, all that stuff. I do not care. Not saying I support what they do. Mm. I'm just saying like, I'm j- I'm watching it based on what I want to be entertained by the TV. The, Separating the, the two. Yeah. Separating just, the athlete yeah. from, you know, the actual sport. Yeah, I can dig that. I have no problem with that. Um, you know, O.J. Simpson kind of got reintroduced to the world with that great documentary, that great 30 for 30 ESPN oh, yeah. had a couple years ago. Um, I did uh, boot up Netflix uh, the other day just looking for something to watch, and boom, it was right there. So, like, whatever deal Netflix has with ESPN and their 30 for 30 series, they they put it back on their streaming site. Shoot, when uh, March Madness was going on, the Fab Five doc was up there, the uh, NC State doc, the um, – uh, everybody hates Duke. Doc was up there, so like they know what they're doing over there at Netflix. And another thing about OJ being kind of reintroduced to the world was um, he was a part of Cameron and Mace, uh rappers from the like the the '90s and early 2000s. They have a podcast where they talk a ton of sports called "It Is What It Is," and he was like a weekly guest on their show. So he got kind of reintroduced to you know a younger generation, and people kind of like found out about OJ and all the things that. You know, he allegedly did and other things that he got convicted of and, you know, his football career and things like that. You know, I'm not going to celebrate him. I'm not going to be out here happy that he's dead or anything like that. He's just like, all right, man. Like, I just remember that whole thing going down when I was a kid and how big of a deal it was. And then having one reaction as a child and then being an adult, having the complete opposite reaction about it, like. When you grow up and you realize, like, wait, we shouldn't be acting like this. We shouldn't be just celebrating he got off for murder just because he's a black man. Nah, dude probably should have been in jail. Nah, probably. Dude should have been in jail for murder. Like, but, you know, those are the things that you deal with as you grow older as an adult. It's a Kenner and Kev show here uh, on 1410 ESPN Radio on Chatterbox Sports. Yes, we know that that was talked about all last week, but off Friday because the bad lettuce. Uh, you were <laughs> off for your birthday. Happy belated birthday, Thank by the you. way. Uh, so, you know, we're just playing catch up. Uh, still a few things to catch up on uh, from over uh, the weekend. I'll talk a little college basketball when we come back. Um, Ohio State, they get a big, you know, we talked a little bit about it with Dan Hope. So I want to touch on that quickly, what that addition means for Ohio State on the hardwood. And then Dayton gets a big addition from the portal. They've been kind of quiet since the season ended. Uh, you know, you know who we're waiting round. to hear from. And, and, yeah, you know, <laughs> in the second round of the NCAA tournament. But they made a big addition um, you know, and got to be fair, you know, we're talking about the, the NIL uh, and the Dayton Six, the, you know, when we talk about the collectives, I was not happy with the way the collective handled a certain situation for Dayton last week, but uh, the collective played a big role in adding this big name to the Dayton Flyers roster. So we'll talk about that when we come back. Keith Byer is going to join us in studio around the corner. It's a big day in baseball, sports, uh, and around the country. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. The Reds are on fire. There's so much more to dive into. Kenner and Cap, 1410 ESPN Radio.
We are back. We are Dayton's radio home of Cincinnati Reds baseball, and the Reds coming off of a big weekend against the White Sox. I mean, I saw it. What? Shout out to Elliot. What up, Elliot? He tweeted out, can the Reds play the White Sox every night? <laughs> That'd be nice. That'd be no, nice. No, they they belong to the Guardians. <laughs> That's our team to beat up on. Well, the Reds back in action tonight. They, they wrapped up that sweep uh, over the White Sox over the weekend. They'll have Seattle later tonight. You know, one of those awesome. Can't wait for the basketball game to tip off at 7.06. <laughs> the baseball, you know, the Reds, Seattle tonight, uh, 9.42 first pitch. Mm-mm. And the Chatterbox guys are going live after the game, right? I, yeah, after every game. Shout out to Trace and Nick Kirby. I salute you. <laughs> I salute you. It's dedicated. Now, and like, but and there's nothing easy about it, but it's easy to do it in April. It's easy to do it when you're coming off of a three-game sweep. It's easy. But damn, they committed to do that last year when they were supposed to lose 100 games. Yeah. Like, I give them credit. I, I don't love any team that much. <laughs> and another thing is it's – like you said, nothing's easy, but it's quote unquote easier to do a post game, especially for a football game. You know, one o'clock kick is going to be over by four, four thirty at the absolute latest. Uh, four thirty kick is going to be over at seven thirty. Uh, if you got the Sunday night game on NBC, it's going to be over like at eleven o'clock. You kind of know when these games aren't going to end. Even like if you do a basketball game, you you know, all right, it's going to end by two and a half hours. Baseball, if it goes extras. Even extras. Hey, man, if we go on, it's a 19th inning. Man, this game could be over at 2, 3 in the morning. Nope. <laughs> no gracias. You know what? Next time we have Trace on, I want to ask him, has he ever had to cancel a post-game show because the game has just went on too long? He has kids, too. Him and Nick. I don't have kids. I have two dogs. Dog. But when I let them out for the final time at 930, I'm done. I'm done. I ain't going back downstairs. I don't blame you. You know, but they 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 had empty bladders over the weekend because I was going downstairs a lot because I had to you know bad bad <laughs> lettuce. You know, is what it is. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, so cool uh, news over the week. So Dayton Flyers, it's kind of quiet after the season ended. Still waiting for that official announcement of Deron Holmes. You know, leaving Dayton. Mm-hmm. I, you know, some people say this solidifies he's not coming back. But man, like I said before, there there's a lot of ways to approach the Deron Holmes situation. For one. NIL, he'll be taken care of financially if he comes back for another year. Obviously, it's going to come down to him going to the to the combine and being told what his draft grade is going to be and what, what what he you know where he could potentially be drafted. If he's going to get a late second round draft grade, coming back makes a lot of sense still um, because you're not guaranteed money in the back end of the draft. He will get a fair shot. I mean, he's super athletic. I mean, he's he's very very good basketball player. Uh, he's very raw right now from an NBA perspective. But you know who knows what the ceiling could be. Uh, the thing is. This is a historically bad draft, according to uh, a lot of analysts out there. So when it comes to Deron Holmes, there's two ways to think of it. It's okay, I'm getting a second-round draft grade in a historically bad draft. Mm-hmm. Like, that right there, so it's either you're taking advantage of that, and that increases my chances of being drafted, but what's that? if that increases your chances of being drafted, but, like, you're just not as good as what you want to be, right. I think that's doing more damage than anything. Coming back for another year, whatever. But when it was announced at Dayton earlier today, Zed Key announced, the former Buckeye announced that he's going you know, to play his final year at Dayton. Huge get for Dayton, by the way. I was bummed when he left Ohio State. He did not play well this past season. He didn't really live up to what I thought he was going to be. Uh, I thought Ohio State had another level to go to if he would have been the Zed Key from two years ago. Uh, never really got back to that. Um, he, he got to that point a little bit late last year and then got knocked out for the rest of the tournament because of his shoulder. Right. So he is injury. He's been banged up for a while hopefully that gets fixed a little bit but man if Duran does come back and it's very unlikely but if Duran comes back with key that's pretty damn cool that that that's a dangerous team right there especially when you have the three-point shooting ability of Brea uh you know and and the talent that they have around it so bottom line is I threw a lot out there but the again historically bad draft according to experts if you're Duran do you go out because that increases your chances of being drafted or is that telling you something? If you're getting, if you're being told by a lot of people you're a late second round draft pick in a historically bad draft, maybe you should come back another year. I, I don't know. I'll be, I'm fascinated to see what ultimately happens with this when it's all said and done. Um, if Deron decides to come back, I'll be more interested to see how they play together. Um, I don't think that they'll. If you thought that they played at a slow tempo last year, with Deron being the only big on the court. They're gonna I would imagine that they will play even slower with two bigs on the court. 
because uh, I never thought that Zed ran the floor very well at Ohio State. So it is interesting to yeah, see. That's probably why he went to Dayton. Oh, AG doesn't make his play fast. Cool, <laughs> I'm going there. <laughs> Goodness gracious, you just can't help yourself. Uh, but, like, in the half-court set and the defensive set, obviously they're going to be even better. Um, the high lows and things of that nature, if both of those guys are back, I just want to see how it will work offensively with them two on the floor. Because I know, like, Deron, he can space the floor a little bit. But, I mean, he does most of his damage in the paint, and that's great. Um, but, like, it's going to be hard to do your damage in the paint when you have a, a non-shooter clogging up the paint. So, you know, questions that we would love to answer, but we don't have answers until Deron says what he's going to do. So is that key at Ohio State without Deron is what, in your opinion, then? Uh, Him coming to U- UD, uh, Zed coming, if Deron goes pro? Yeah. Because uh, Key announced it today. He's officially a flyer. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, without Deron there, I would imagine somewhere around eight points and six rebounds. See, because I think he – he helps Bray a lot because, okay. to me, they'll maximize Bray more because with Duran, Duran's best on the block, mm-hmm. but every once in a while he'd get that, oh, man, I need to get out here to the perimeter because my, my only way of making it to the NBA is being able to knock down threes and sometimes got away from what made him the most. And, by the way, with doing that, still the most dominant player on the floor pretty much every given night, even in the tournament, which was wild. I mean, he held his own against Arizona. Uh, obviously, we saw how dominant he was in the first round. So, uh, you know, look, the, the guy could play, but – with Zed, he's not going to be floating around the perimeter. He's right. going to be on that block, and he's going to—he's not going to, you know, get that dominant defensive attention that Duran was getting. But right. at the same time, it's going to be a lot easier for Bray to get shots off, knowing that he's going to be living on the block, that type of thing too. So we'll see. I, Flyers need to make other moves, but I think that's a heck of a get. That's a big name. Um, yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. That, that's a big name. It's a big get. And when he was playing his best basketball, Ohio State was playing their best basketball. So hopefully, they can get that out of him. I would love to see uh, Bray with the ball in his hands a, a lot more. I want to see him be the playmaker. I want to see him be the decision maker because he has the size. He absolutely has the jump shot. You add that playmaking ability to your game, especially like if Deron is is back with the team. Like if you throw a bad lob, he can still go get it. You know what I'm saying? So like even like in crunch time moments, like he had the ball in his hands. Um, so I want to see that even more from the Flyers this upcoming season, especially if Deron is back. Um, unfortunate news over the weekend as well. Um, it was announced Don Donaher, mm-hmm. um, legendary person first. And once it coach person, never heard of an individual that has never had anything bad said about him before. Like mm-hmm. I've never met one single person that has ever said anything remotely close to being critical of Don Donaher. And it was always about him, the person. Um, I had a few interactions with them over the years. The one that still is my favorite. It was uh, went to the when Anthony Grant was hired at the press conference. I kind of hung around, was trying to get a quote from you know Don Hart at the time. I was only a part timer at the time, and was trying to get a, a a clip to use for my Sunday morning show. I was only doing the show on Sundays at that time, and you know Don Hart said, "Give me time, give me time." You know, he just time never. You know, eventually I just said, "Okay, I gotta go. I I, I can't you know find a window. I didn't want to be rude and interrupt and all this." Well, he did say he goes, "If you don't find me, he goes, I'm in the phone book." So I mean, <laughs> it's laughing. So I went and I found his number in the phone book, gave him a call, um, didn't answer the first time, left a message, calls me back and said, I, I'm it, it, my favorite line from his son. I didn't I didn't think you would even know what a phone book was. <laughs> so he was very impressed at the fact that I knew what a phone book was and that I was able to hunt him down in the phone book. Um, and he's out just do, do you know, doing regular you know, person stuff, just mowing the grass. He just said, hey, sorry, I was mowing the grass. So, uh, yeah, but he came on the show with me uh, the the Sunday after the Saturday press conference when AG was announced as the new head coach. That was my favorite interaction that I had with him. The second favorite one, we and you went to when game day was yes. in town. And, I, you know, sitting back, and that was such a unique, rare experience to have game day here. And I'm watching, you know, Obi, I'm watching Jalen Crutcher, I'm watching the players, and I look over my favorite memory from game day being in town it wasn't jay will and and you know obviously jay billis and everyone being at center court you know whatever it was looking over and you know ag regardless of you know all the you know fun we had back and forth with you know ag played for him Mm -hmm. and donaher dom you know legendary dayton flyers head coach person two and ag you know on cloud nine national coach of the year that year dayton one of the best teams in the country that year game days in town and he is standing side by side with Coach Donaher as they're just looking on. The lights are off. They're the band's playing. Uh, you know the video package. All that fun stuff's happening. And those two are just grinning from ear to ear. 
I'll never forget that. I got chills that day because if you're a basketball, if you're just a sports fan and you just see how things come full circle, that's, that was your player that you know you coached and was a very good player for you and was a very good coach, comes back and now has this team. I forgot where they were even ranked at the time at, at that point. I mean, that was the last game of the regular season, so I guess they were number three at that time. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is there was no cooler scene to me than watching Anthony Grant and Coach Donahue stand side-by-side side with game day in town as they both smiled ear-to-ear ear just looking on, just a proud moment. You could just, like I said, I'll never forget that uh, in my interaction, having him on the show, but yeah, giving me, you know, laughing because, I, son, I didn't think you knew what a phone book was, <laughs> uh, but rest in peace to the Hall of Fame legend of a person and basketball coach, and again, I mean, I, the stories you read about him, I mean, he was not just a Dayton basketball guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, everyone had nothing but great things. I mean, Bob Knight had so many great things to say about him back in the day, about you know their interactions. Jay Billis, I mean, national media coming out and singing his praises. Just a, a hell of a person, Hall of Fame person, Hall of Fame coach. Uh, rest in peace, Coach Don Donaher. Absolutely. Speaking of another great person, it's Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball. Obviously, all the players across the league wear number 42 in honor of Jackie Robinson. So um, people familiar with the show know that I'm doing this 75 hard challenge. And one of the rules of the 75 hard challenge is to read 10 pages of a book. And I'm in the middle of this book called $40 Million Slaves. And there's a segment on Jackie Robinson and part of the issues that he had when he integrated baseball. And something I didn't know about Jackie Robinson is he was a four-time letter winner at UCLA in baseball, basketball, football, and track. This is a bona fide athlete Mm -hmm. we're talking about. I do long for the days of guys being athletes and being able to basically pick up any sport at the drop of a dime. We have such a culture now where, hey, man, you're a baseball player. You're a basketball player. Like, kids give up on sports so easily and focus on one thing. Jackie Robinson was not one of those guys. He was able to do that in college. And obviously, one of the best baseball players of all time. Um, And this is a day in baseball that I personally think needs to be celebrated even more. And not only talk about Jackie Robinson, but also talk about all the guys from the Negro Leagues because – you know, believe it or not, the Negro Leagues saved baseball. When we were at World War II, a lot of the baseball players went over to fight the war for the country and things like that, and they were looking to get that zeal, that that firepower, that wow factor, and ultimately Major League Baseball started going to the Negro Leagues to get some of those players and brought that wow factor back to Major League Baseball. Salute to Jackie Robinson. It's a Kenner and Kev's show here on 1410 ESPN Radio. You talked about those you know, those freak athletes who could, you know, be dominant any sport. Uh, well, that's uh, one of those athletes going to join us uh, coming up here on the other side because this is a guy that, you know, shared the story. If he wasn't going to go to Ohio State and be a dominant Heisman runner-up and go to the NFL for 13 years, uh, he would have gone on to play Major League Baseball. Baseball was Keith Byer's uh, favorite sport and said that had he gone the college route for baseball, he would have played in the same outfield as Barry Bonds. Uh, and he turned that down uh, to, to go to Ohio State. Right, like in that while, but uh, with dominant track star, dominant baseball player, dominant basketball player, dominant football. I mean, he did it all. But now he's gonna hang out with us when we come back. When Barry Bonds went to Arizona State. Arizona State. State. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, wow, KB, you gave up Arizona. State. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, nonetheless, we'll talk with Keith Byers on the other side. It's the Kinner and Kev Show, fourteen ten ESPN Radio, and on the Chatterbox Sports Network. We'll be right back.
All right, and we are back. It's the Kinner and Kev show here on a Monday. We hope everybody had a great weekend. Off and rolling here. Hour number two as we wrap things up before heading into hour number three. We appreciate everyone tuning in on 1410 ESPN Radio, the iHeartRadio app, uh, Chatterbox Sports, of course. Uh, but hanging out with us here in studio, of course, you can catch his show every Monday, at least for the remainder of the month, uh, before we move it to Wednesdays for the, the off season, if you will, the summer. <laughs> but the Keith Byers Radio Show presented by Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken every Monday from noon to one, soon to be moving to Wednesdays from noon to one throughout uh, the, the spring, uh, the rest of spring and summer until next fall, of course. But uh, KB hanging out with us here in studio. Mr. Byers, welcome. Happy Monday. Oh, happy Monday, too. It's it, it's not a manic Monday. It's a good Monday. It's not even an eclipse Monday. I missed last Monday when we got to see the eclipse. Where were you for the eclipse? I was at Miami Valley Country Club with my wife and family. We were sitting back. Uh, I was I had my back to the moon, to the sun, because my uh, reflexes may have accidentally kicked in. I looked up. Oh, I forgot my glasses. Put the glasses on. <laughs> so I didn't even trust myself. I kept my back to it until every time I looked up, get my glasses, I'm going to put my glasses on. And Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's yeah, a, we, whew. We, we popped out just over, uh, you know, in, in the parking lot just to take a quick uh, glance up safely, of course, with our glasses that Lee's gave us. So shout out to Chuck and Cam and yes. Lee's for that. But uh, no, uh, so, wow, you know, fun weekend. You had the Masters over the weekend, the, the Ohio State spring game. And, you know, everyone, you know, we talked earlier. I remember, you know, everyone's like, did you see the spring game? Did you see the spring game? And I'm like, the spring game, I did not get a chance to catch it. However, um, when I do have a chance to catch it, it's usually just on, you know, it's football. It's 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 Ohio State football. It's at the shoe. I've been to spring games. I go to the spring game just to take, you know, to take in the atmosphere and the environment and all that because it's a great environment at the shoe. But I don't really get a whole lot from the spring game from a football <laughs> standpoint. I, you know, did you, it didn't feel a need yeah, for you to It's not as if, like, fix. man, you know, I really wasn't buying into this Ohio State team until I saw them at the spring game. You know what? Now I think they're national championship contenders. Like, I don't really get a whole lot of it from that. I laugh at some of the, the blogger sites that, you know, top five takeaways, uh, you know, f- top five things to look at heading into the spring game. I'm like, Nothing. I mean, you get a chance to watch the players. You get a chance to hear the, the whistles, you know, the crack of the pads, kind of. Uh, I, I don't know. For you, from a former player standpoint, what do you take away from the spring game? Um, a lot of people take it serious. I'm not saying I'm mocking it, but I just don't take it serious from a – there's no implications on the upcoming season, in my opinion, based on the spring game alone. Yeah, it, it, it isn't. I mean, I think once you get to the final, you get to the spring game, the, the probably the number one story for me coming out of the spring game, who didn't get hurt? <laughs> you know, that's the way they kind of practice. Oh, we made it. Whew, no major injuries. I mean, you even heard before the game started, you know, Ryan Day's talking about, well, you know, we're going to get Travion in, but he doesn't need to get hit, you know, too much. He doesn't need enough hits on his body. And uh, Mecca, Buka, we don't, we don't need them, uh, you know, out here. We, we know what they can do. It's not a part of, about knowing what they can do. Let them go do what they do. Let them go play. You know, I'm thinking, of, you know, before my junior year, you know, at Ohio State, I was already second team All American and All Big Ten. But you know, I wasn't. You know, I went through every spring practice. You know, and whatever, you know, whatever it called for, we was getting hit. And even in, in the spring game before my junior season, uh, our quarterback got sacked and broke his leg. They're like what? What? Mike Tomzak, starting quarterback, got sacked and broke his leg. It wasn't intentional. It happens. And Mike assured us, I'm going to be back for the season. And he's like, you should, this was, our spring game was in May. It wasn't the middle of all, <laughs> April. It was the first Saturday in May. And Mike Tomzak is telling us, I'm going to be back, you know, when the season starts. And rehab, you know, he broke it with tibia, fibia, mm-hmm. t- yeah. Uh, and Mike worked his butt off, but it's a broken bone. You still got to let it mend. He missed the first two games of the season and played, came back for the third. And uh, we ended up winning, you know, going, going to the Rose Bowl that season, winning the Big Ten. Uh, but all summer, you imagine what that was like, all summer long. How's, how's, how's my Tom's act doing? How's his rehab? What's well, a broken leg? I mean, he's on crutches. <laughs> he just got his crutches. He's in walking boot. You know, is he ready to play football? So we had to answer that question all summer. You know, and that was a shorter summer than it is now. You know, now if a quarterback or anybody gets hurt in the middle of April, they got the rest of April, all of May, all of June, all of July, and possibly all of August, you know, to get ready for the season. So why are y'all such afraid of injuries? I don't want no one to get hurt. But I think you need to practice full speed if you expect them to play full speed. So these spring practices, they're practicing full speed, right? 
overall, but there, when I say full speed, I mean well, not tackling like, to the ground. It's like when you you 80%. have certain periods. Yeah, I mean, but I'm saying when you're, they have different periods in practice, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm saying when you do seven on sevens, you don't tackle, but when you're doing your team periods and your uh, inside running periods, you need to tackle. That means you need to come off fire hard and block too. I mean, we used to have some drills that uh, we used to do during training camp and uh, little in spring ball. We one drill was called hoot and holler. Hoot and holler was uh, if you guys are familiar with the Oklahoma drill, it was like the Oklahoma drill on steroids. The Oklahoma drill is one guy laying down on the ground and one offense, and when you get up and you kind of run and try to tackle him. Hoot and holler, when I was at Ohio State, you had three linemen, three defensive linemen, three offensive linemen, a quarterback, a running back, and a safety. So you really four on four, but the quarterback don't count. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, kind of like today's football. Yeah, so the quarterback don't tell. All he's gonna do is hand me, and, and they have us in a enclosed area, and he's got three linemen, three defensive linemen, a safety at ten yards, and me at five yards. The running back at five yards, and the quarterback is only gonna say left, right, middle. <laughs> so the linemen they're coming off, you know, trying to block, and then and but even you know, if they get their block, the the, the safety. It's free. He's coming at it, so we're gonna have some collisions. And you got three. You're gonna run the ball three times to get ten yards. <laughs> so it's up to you. How, however, three chances to get ten yards. A lot of times it was only taking me one to two chances to get ten, because I'm like y'all open up a hole. <laughs> it's gonna be a major collision here. That's because you have two <laughs> offensive linemen with an offensive lineman that run as a running back running behind it. Oh so, man! So know. we were physical. I mean, that was physical. I mean, you know, so we call it hoot and holler. So you're going to be a lot of hooting and hollering. There's a lot of hitting going on. But that's how you got better. They, they don't even run that drill no more. Now. Oh, no, oh, that would be, you know, uh, the caveman days. Oh, you guys are making barbaric. Very barbaric even. What are you guys doing? Hey, you're toughening us up. That's what it's like. It's, the football's a tough game. Well, how often do you see them hit the seven-man sled at practice? I, they have one, but, you know, we just had a two-man sled with the uh, running back coach be standing on it or the seven-man sled with the offensive line coaches on there, and they had the brakes on it. Oh, oh yeah. It's they used to love Pushing that thing all over the field, that's going to make you work. We got uh, Keith Byers with us here in studio again. Uh, Kinner and Kev show here, 1410 ESPN Radio, the Chatterbox Sports Network. Uh, but, uh, you know, kind of just takeaways from the spring game but from over the weekend. And, you know, we're, we're hearing so much about the, the the quarterbacks, too. And, you know, obviously, you know, Will Howard coming in, they, you know, comes in out of the transfer portal, a lot of NIL money thrown his way. So automatically you just assume he's the guy. And he got the guy snaps over the weekend, it, it sounds like. But, you know, uh, but there was a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jim Tressel was, you know, at the he was at UD Arena for the Circle of Champions. And, you know, we got a chance to talk about, you know, the his I wanted to get his thoughts on the, the 12 team playoff. And he said the reason he feels good about Ohio State as much as any other team out there is because, you know, you have to have depth. He goes, it's not about your roster heading into your season. It's about what's your roster like at the end of the season. He goes, oh, yeah. so everyone's going to talk about your starters, but the chances of you having every starter healthy heading into the playoff or making it throughout the playoff is very slim. That's what makes these spring practices so important. That's what makes these the camps so important when we get there. Um, you know, I'm mocking the spring game. I'm not mocking spring practice, but he talked about the significance of the depth as far as that's concerned. So depth that quarterback, depth that running back. You know, we've talked about previous weeks, depth that offensive line, defensive line. Depth is going to be key. You being a former player, your takeaways as far as depth when it comes to this team, because to win a national championship, we make so much, such a big deal about the starters, but it's about the guys behind them as well. Oh, you're 100% right on that. I mean, we we don't talk about it anywhere near as much in college football that we do in pros. Mm -hmm. You know, when the minute Joe Burrow goes down, oh, there goes the bingo season. You know, Deshaun Watson go down, oh, that hurts the Browns. You know, but teams win it. So you have to develop your whole roster if you're trying to win, you know, Super Bowls, you're trying to win national championships. You need to develop that roster and get that depth. You know, I talked about it earlier today on my show. You know, Ohio State goals going into every game, it should never change. You need to have seven offensive linemen ready to go that they can start at any minute. They ought to be, you know, just – chomping on the bit, and you ought to figure out a way to get that sixth and seventh lineman in the game throughout instead of, well, he hadn't had no reps. 
Well, why not? Play him. Well, you don't got to play your starting five, you know, the whole 60 minutes of every game. You know, put that backup guard in, that backup tackle or the center. Let him get some reps throughout the game. Well, you shouldn't lose because he ought to be seven ready to go. We ought to have three deep at quarterback ready to go. It's happened in the past. We won a national championship last time. We needed three quarterbacks. We don't win three. We don't win national championship if we didn't have three ready to go. You know, yes, uh, Cardell Jones probably wasn't ready week one, but he was staying engaged throughout the season. So once number one quarterback got hurt before the season started in Car- in uh, Braxton Miller, it was J.T. Barrett, J.T. Barrett, J.T. Barrett. Oh, J.T. Barrett got hurt. What? Who is our backup quarterback again? Oh, Cardell Jones. Who was he? We haven't seen him play. He's got all. You think J.T. Barrett's got a good arm? Wait till you see this guy. <laughs> and Cardell came in. They, they called him 12 gauge. We know why. He had a strong arm, big strong kid. And he won his three biggest games you could ever play, the Big Ten, you know, championship and two playoff games, hmm. win the national championship. But that's having that depth ready. I mean, look at our team last year at wide right receiver position. We had pretty much that depth. You know, and Mecca and Booker played last year with a high ankle sprain. But we had Marvin Harrison, who was the, the, the big guy. But then all the other running back, other wide receivers, you know, stepped up as well. I mean, Cardell Tate, I'm looking for an outstanding year. You know, from him and then Jeremiah Smith, incoming freshman. You know, so we got depth at the wide receiver position. The corners, you know, we have depth there. You need the depth all across your roster. And that should be Ryan Goals, Ryan Go Ryan Day's number one goal is to not only have depth, but develop it at every position. Last thing before we let you go, Keith. Uh, we talked about this before your show started earlier this afternoon, but you know, you talked about uh it was a comment that Urban Meyer made during the broadcast that caught your attention about, you know, you hear a lot of old school coaches just reemphasize, and it's not really old school coaches, but a lot of the analysts keep reemphasizing this former coaches, man, you know, it's just so important to, to re-recruit your roster. You know, we know how much that the recruiting is the lifeblood of college athletics, college basketball, college football. We talk about it so much, but you know, it's funny when you hear coaches say you've got to re-recruit your roster every year. And that means re-recruiting the guys that are already on your roster. And I'm, you know, we were talking about kind of what that means, and I am kind of curious. You know, you're when you're getting recruited, you're going through the wooing process. You know, they're they're telling you everything you want to hear. They're telling you you're the best thing that's ever happened to to college football. I'm, you know, from my perspective, it sounds like, oh man, we got to re-recruit you. Now we got to go back to being nice to you. Now we got to go back to to <laughs> telling you how great you are. When you were recruited to Ohio State, when you committed there, and when you finally got on the field, on the practice field for the first time, what point did you realize that the, the wooing was over, that the, the honeymoon stage was over? And your thoughts on when you hear coaches say, we got to re-recruit our roster, your thoughts? Well, that's a good question. Lot, lots of different. You know, remember when, uh, I'm saying to myself, when you were getting wooed, you know, you missed a lot of phone calls. But you make a phone call back. Oh, it's you. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know you called me five times, Coach. I'm just not calling you back. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You're busy. You're, <laughs> You're busy. busy. I understand <laughs> it. I get it. <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I, I remember uh, old coach used to be the coach at Ohio State, the assistant coach and coach of the Carolina Panthers, Dom Capers. Dom Capers was the uh, defensive back coach at uh, Tennessee when I was getting recruited. Dom Capers would drive to uh, Dayton, Ohio, which is four hours from Knoxville. I would see him in the morning uh, before I would, you know, get into school. He was sitting there waiting. Hey, Keith, how you doing? Hey, Coach, how you doing? Hey, don't you got practice today? It's, I know, I got time to get back. You driving four hours, just come say hello to me? You know, so he did a great job recruiting me. So you get that. Then you get on campus and, you know, hey, Coach, he walked by you in the, in the, in the hallway. Hey, Coach, you didn't see me? It was Earl Bruce, he, he, your coach. Yeah, that coach is me. Remember me? Uh, uh, he act like he. What's that guy's name again? Didn't you recruit him, coach? Which, you know, we didn't have a transfer portal, and so unless you was a starter or like that, you kind of like went by the wayside. You're like, wow. So to answer your question, when did I get my first wake up call? We had we went uh, we had a um, a dinner at the golf course, and we had to catch the shuttle bus to there. And so they said, uh, first team, offense and defense, y'all on the first bus. Second bus was second team, offense and defense, and then the third and fourth bus, AYOs. And I wasn't a second team yet, or first team. I'm like, 
Who's AYO? What, who, what, who, what, what, I mean, all you others. <laughs> what? <laughs> all you AYOs, all you others get on. We don't care what bus you get on. You get on the bus, make Just sure be that. there, right? We care <laughs> about the starters. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm an AYO. I can't have this. I'm a, and you've been the you guy others, your whole high school career. I've been career. the guy all my high school career. They was like kissing my behind. Keep coming out there. Now I'm here. I ain't nothing. I ain't, I ain't the starter. Ain't, ain't nobody paying attention to me. Before, when I sneezed, somebody was handing me a tissue. Hey, you need tissue? We need tissue? Now I sneeze. Ah, oh, dude, you're terrible. Hey, cover your mouth next time. Get away from me. Who are you? So you have to make yourself be recruited, you know, once again. But now today when Urban says it, re recruiting them, you got to keep them happy. The best thing, I mean, but the, the only thing that uh, Earl Bruce would do my freshman year, and only had six carries, he would tell the running back coach, he wouldn't even do it himself. He would tell the running back coach, to because uh, we brought in six running backs. He said, uh, make sure you meet with those running backs and just assure them and tell them they're going to be okay. Like throughout the season. So, Keith, uh, the running back coach wants to see you in his office. I'll go in the office. You know, this is the best place to be. You're going to be bad when you get a chance. You know, when you start, you're going to be bad. You're going to be, you know, next year is going to be your year. You're going to be bad. All right, you're going to be, I oh, can't wait. This is the best place to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't have came here, right? Uh, yeah, coach, I guess. You're going to be all right. You hang out. So I walk out the office and here goes another <laughs> running back in. Boy, you know, you're going to be the man next year. They're going to be bad. You know, this is the best place to be. So then we've been like, and then what coach tell you? He told me I was going to start next year. That's what he told me. <laughs> what did he tell you? So what? He lying. All, all of us ain't going to be starting next year. Like, now he told me I'm the man. This is the best place to be. That's why I wouldn't have came here. I'm like, wait a minute. Somebody being lied to. Somebody's being deceived. Who? Which one of us is it? You know, because he just told me, don't worry about all that stuff. It's going to be you. That's the ultimate good cop. <laughs> that's the ultimate good cop, bad cop scenario. I was like, okay, so Earl Bruce, you wouldn't even tell me yourself. You got to send the assistant coach. Those things happen. But Urban is right. You, But you got to keep them all happy. I mean, we're in the age of the transfer portal. You know, it, it happens. But at the end of the day, you got to be happy where you are. I always tell the kids, your worst day on campus, if you can look in the mirror and say, I'm still happy to be here, you chose the right school. So don't be always in a, in a hurry to go somewhere else. You know, you your own happiness. And you know, it, it'll happen more often than not. You stay and do the right things, you're going to get your opportunity. And I believe in a place like Ohio State, you get your opportunity more often than not. And catch the Keith Byers Show uh, Mondays from noon to 1 until May 1st, which is uh, then we'll move to Wednesdays uh, just because, you know, he's so busy with all his golf tournaments yeah, on the weekend. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, poor guy. But, yeah, Over so turn. the Keith Byers Show presented by Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken uh, every Monday from noon to 1 until May 1st, and then it'll move to Wednesdays from noon to 1 uh, until we get to football season in the fall. So there you go. But, KB, thank you for your Thanks time for today. Uh, yeah, more, see you guys. More of the Kidder and Kev Show when we come back.